So I've been a part of a lot of um, local conversations around the jail lately, and I don't want to politicize our next presenter, but one of the questions that comes up is, what kind of efforts and resources are going into conversations around coordinating care and what our community needs are and how to improve those things. And so we do have a process that's in place in our county as well as others. And Angela Warren has been the person that spearheaded that. And uh, Angela and I go way back. We've worked together for years, consider her a friend. So I'm very, great, I'm very grateful that she's willing to do this. And as part of the ask from me in terms of her presenting today, I asked her, I asked her to dumb it down to whatever degree she could so that it was like at its most foundational um, in terms of where it comes from, why we do it, what that process has looked like from the start to the end um, so that everybody could potentially understand this. And uh, that was my personal request. Uh, if you want her to go into more depth and detail, we do have an opportunity for questions. Angela, thank you so much for coming today. The Jefferson Regional Health Alliance that I work for is um, basically a collaborative think tank of healthcare leaders. Um, Alan, I think, may be the only person in here that's actually on that board, but Alan is this, an example of the sterling leaders that we have around that table who meet every other month <laughs> and talk about, from a systems level perspective, what are the challenges we're facing? What are the things that maybe we can't do independently but that we could do together? What could we look at in a different way when we all get in the room together and have some of those kinds of conversations? It's been around since about 2005, um, officially as a 501c3 since 2008. And truly, its sole purpose is that systems level collaboration and giving those CEO level leaders a place to be with their peers to have those kinds of conversations. Um, and it's a really interesting group um, of people and the kinds of things they take on, for instance, have been um, the Oregon Pain Guidance OPG group was a pilot project at JRHA beginning in about 2009. Um, I don't know if any of you know of COHO, the Choosing Options, Honoring Options, End of Life Care, Advanced Directives and Pulsed Movement. That was a pilot project of JRHA's. Um, Reliance eHealth Collaborative actually started as a pilot project, the Jefferson Health Information Exchange at JRHA. So it's been a place where leaders have come together around ideas and launched some things that have gone on and had lives of their own and some other things that have had short-term duration. The history of this chip that you have in front of you and the community health assessment that um, informed it is that back in 2016, at our board strategic planning retreat, a couple of the leaders, one happened to be a CCO um, executive, one a hospital executive, said, you know, I don't understand why so many of us are spending time and money to do our assessments every two years, three years, five years, whatever, and we all do the same thing. And wouldn't it be interesting if we did it together? And so there was a lot of talk and the hesitancies that come with the loss of control around, well, we've been doing it this way for a long time and it works for us. Um, and so in 2016, we formed a steering committee. The board put res um, um, representatives from their organizations together to start talking about what would it look like if Jackson and Josephine County had one community health assessment that was that high level strategic um, look at the community, and then a community health improvement plan, which would basically be a health strategic plan for the two counties. And that's what you have in front of you, um, the CHIP, or those of you that have the excerpts, the behavioral health section of the CHIP, um, which was just finished in June um, of this year. So this is called All In for Health. Um, it is separate from JRHA. It is a community-wide initiative. We're just basically the backbone organization that holds it. And right now, as their staff member, I'm sort of the coordinator of the project. But honestly, it's community members like Darren, like Danny Swafford, who are chairing the work groups, who are helping write the documents, who are are helping us figure out how to move forward with this work. Uh, community health assessment, which if you haven't seen it, it is a giant reference document. It's available online. Um, the link is, is there um, and it'll be at the end of the slideshow as well to a lot of data that was gathered over a, a one year period. We brought in some consultants from outside the area who've done this sort of thing in collaborative communities before. And they looked at a lot of data and they asked a lot of questions of our community to help us figure out what are our strengths and what are our needs. And that document was completed in December of 2018 and then was taken as the basis. The community feedback that came in that and the analysis of the data in that is what drove the health improvement plan that we're working from. The health improvement plan was exactly that, taking the top priorities that rose to the top for our community in the assessment and putting it into some kind of a health improvement plan, goals and strategies that we could as a community start taking action on. 
What we used for this is something, it's the public health gold standard in this country called MAP, the MAP framework, which is mobilizing for action through planning and partnerships. It's a really detailed process of how in an ongoing iterative manner, communities assess, plan, evaluate, act, assess, plan, evaluate, act, to keep their health assessments and health improvement planning current. And so we started this process back in 2016. Um, and you'll see there are six phases of MAP there. The first one, organizing and engaging partners, I have to tell you, is the very messiest. Um, when you've got as many partners, and as you know here, it's not just healthcare that's a partner in a lot of this work. Um, but trying to get a sense of who the partners are, who's willing to come on board at the beginning, who's willing to compromise, give a little, get a little, and make something work. Um, and so we spent a lot of time in that work group listening to the partners around the table and what their needs were and what they were willing to do um, to make this happen in a collaborative way. Um, some visioning and community building. Actually, I'll just go over that really quickly. Next, collecting the data and conducting the actual assessments, identifying and prioritizing the issues. And then, as of this year, in January, we started with developing the goals and strategies for the health improvement plan. And as of July, we're just beginning that action cycle of how we start acting on this work, what we've learned. So the organizing um, in this area, Jackson Josephine County, you all know all of this. Three CCOs, two hospital systems, three federally qualified health centers, um, two lo local public health authorities, mental health authorities. It was a lot of significant high level partners who had requirements to do assessments and plans, plus a lot of, of partners that use those assessments and plans. So we had to figure out if you're um, a CCO and you have to do it every five years, or you're a hospital and you have to do it every three years, or you're a public health department that has every five years, or you're a federally qualified health center who every two years has to use data from a recent assessment, how do we find a cycle that will meet everyone's needs and be current enough that we can do it together? And what ended up happening after about a year of work is that Asante and Providence let our steering committee um, collaboratively participate in their hospital, their separate hospital health needs assessments that they did back in um, 2016 and 2017. And then they agreed to go and do the whole thing a year early collaboratively and stop doing it by themselves. And so they took on the expense of doing it early and partnering with the rest of the community. And we found that by doing the community assessment in 18, we could get on a three-year cycle that would meet everyone's needs. So we completed it in 18. The plan in 19, we'll do it again in 21 and 22. And the three-year cycle hopefully will then be sustainable for everyone. These are the original steering committee organizations that met in 2016 and 2017 to develop a process to figure out what kinds of things we needed to, what kinds of issues we needed to work through, um, where, were, where there was give and where there was take and how we could make this work. Um, and you'll notice that a lot of the partners are people that probably participate regularly with this group in some way or another. Then we did some visioning and community building at the first part of 2017, and this is where we really started to deal with what you probably, many of you may have seen before, is this collaborative continuum of turf versus trust. Everybody theoretically wants this to work because collaboratively it does make sense. But when you get down to the nitty gritty of, okay, but I have to report to my board and we have to do it this way in order to continue to be able to assess things as we have been, um, there's a lot of back and forth. And so we spent a significant amount of time and I will tell you, um, as we've learned from others in other parts of the state, we have significant collaboration and collaborative willingness in this community that a lot of communities don't have. We're really, really fortunate to have been able to get over some pretty big hurdles um, to do this big thing together. Um, a vision statement and values, um, which are in the chip, and I'll let you see those for yourselves. I will call um, out, though, that um, accountability is really important, and inclusive community voice, and from the get-go, the inclusive community voice was the most important one. We wanted to make sure we weren't just telling the community what they needed, but that we were doing our best to listen to what the community says they need then devising our, our, our solutions and going back out again and checking back with them to see if we heard them right. So in January of 2018, we brought in a group called Health Resources in Action. They're Boston-based. They've done 80 different collaborative community health assessments across the United States. Um, they had a branch based in Seattle that came and worked with us here over the year. And one of the reasons we selected them is their focus is also on community engagement. 
And while they said a year was longer than they typically do for assessments, we said this is the first time we're doing it. We want to do it as well as we can so that three years from now the group wants to do it together again. And we want a long period to listen to our community because we've got two counties and this is a rural area that has lots of subset communities. So we know it's going to take us a while to get around to everybody. And they agreed to six months of community engagement in that year long process. So the big change, and if you were on, if any of you are on the Asante or Providence hospital boards, you would know that as a hospital board, when you get your community health needs assessment in the past, typically it's going to be focused on cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and you're going to have things that sound like what you'd expect to find in a health assessment. Because this was a community collaborative high level document, we were using a different lens. We were going through the social determinants of health, which is why when you see the priorities, you won't find cardiovascular disease as one of the targets that we're trying to improve. Um, you will find housing, and you will find behavioral health, and you will find parenting skills. Um, so a very different look at health as a community. Fortunately, the hospitals were willing to, and I don't think their boards were completely shocked at um, doing things this way, because all of our partner organizations are working on social determinants of health. The first thing the Health Resources and Action Consultants did is they asked us to pull together a lot of data for them and then they had data themselves from local, regional, state, and national data, over 200 sources. This is just a list of some of the things that they looked at. General demographics, they looked at um, adverse childhood experiences, work and scores in areas, the economy, education, food insecurity, homelessness and housing, chronic diseases, mortality, um, social support, safety and crime. Um, immunizations, a lot of different different sources and in the back of the CHAW you'll see that's a, it's a searchable PDF online for all of that data that's in there which we're about to start updating for the next next cycle. Then they did community stakeholder interviews and I think a few of you in this room may have been part of that stakeholder group. Um, business, community clinics, county justice, hospitals, the housing authority, um, commercial insurers, mental health providers, police, public health departments, school districts, social service agencies and veteran services. And it was a mix. Most of those were fairly high level, although a few of them were more on the ground direct service providers in some of those sectors. Um, but they did hour long interviews with folks about what they thought of the general health of the community, what they thought the community's greatest strengths were and what the community's greatest challenges were. Then we conducted community forums in Jackson and Josephine counties and also focus groups. And the focus groups were small, about 10 to 12 people. Um, we spent about an hour and a half with each of those focus groups and we specifically targeted some areas. So for instance, with our rural communities, we went out and did one out in Roosh. We had something in Cave Junction. We had something in Rogue River. Um, we made sure we were reaching out to and holding some of these meetings in communities that either have transportation challenges or frequently consider themselves out of the loop when a county discussion happens. Um, communities of color, one particular focus group was we, we put together a group that was just Latina moms with very young children to ask them specifically what are the challenges they face, um, how do they access the system, what works and doesn't work for them. Homeless youth, we had one focus group at Maslow Project with homeless teens, which was a really interesting conversation. They were incredibly surprised to be asked. Um, I don't think they get listened to a lot on big issues like that. Um, seniors parents of young children, individuals with disabilities, um, a lot of different groups were targeted so that we'd make sure those voices were included in the assessment. The next step was to do a community survey and this was an online survey but it was also done in paper form like the WIC clinics, um, women, infant and children clinics in both counties um, had like here in Jackson County they had iPads out in the waiting room so that while people were waiting for their appointment they could take the survey. They reached out to try and get the survey physically in the hands of folks who might not um, go online or have access to be able to take it online. Um, the consultants told us that if we could get three to four hundred results, we could feel really good with a, with a group the size of our two counties with our results and we had over 1,100 that were completed. So they were excited because they felt like that gave us really good data and also it showed a real readiness on the part of our community. They wanted to be heard and they were excited that we were asking them and going to do something about it. Um, some of the questions we asked were, 
What are top health and health-related issues that, you, that have a large impact on you or your family? What are the issues that make it difficult for you to get health or social services that you need? And what health or social services are lacking in your community? Um, it was interesting, one of the things that we got back initially, which was very surprising to all of us, there was a, a community track and there was a provider track. So if you worked for one of the service providers in this area, you might have taken it as a provider and as a community member. So the questions were slightly different um, for those two groups. When you ask community members, um, what is the overall status of you and your family's health? And it was a, a Likert scale. And most of them would say, good. And then you ask them the next question, what is your community's health? And a vast majority of them said, fair. And so it was really interesting that, that most people reported OK, even though we know there are a lot of struggles. But they were really concerned about their neighbors and really feeling like there was a lot of health, um, lacking of health around them that they were concerned about. After we got all of those 200 data sources and the information that was captured by the focus groups and forums and the survey data, and they ran it through all of the algorithms and things that they do at the consultancy, they came back to us with a whole bunch of information and said, all right, let's start looking at the, the mess of stuff that we've gathered here and trying to add some um, conversations and assessment around that. The first one was a half day forces of change where we got together about 40 people and they were outside of healthcare. We had RVTD there, we had um, education sector there, higher ed and, and K through 12 education, um, all kinds of social services, um, groups like Grandma's To Go. Um, it was a really interesting mix of people that participated, business leaders, workforce leaders. And they came in and spent time in small groups working on what are the things that are impacting or could potentially impact health in our community. And of course, obviously, two big things that came up. One was the marijuana industry and how it's changing all sorts of things. And one was smoke and fires in our valley, that there are two big things that everybody says is impacting way more than you would have thought. And so there were really good discussions around those. The consultants, again, on that, they figured we'd come up with about 10 or 12 really big forces of change. And by the end of the day, the group had come up with 81. So we have a very eager and thoughtful group here in Jackson and Josephine counties. And it took a while for them to take all of that input and pull it back into um, what ended up being a group of, I think it was about 20 or so um, coalesced together. We also spent a half day doing a public health system analysis. And that is not how is Jackson County Public Health doing or how is Josephine County Public Health doing? It's the whole system that addresses the, the essential services of public health as defined by the national standards for 10 essential system services. So it's a lot of providers, including you know, the faith community is a participant in the public health system. All kinds of things that, that are meeting the needs of our community's health and a half day on that. So those data pieces were also pulled in together. And after about two or three months, um, the consultants came back to us with a big report out, a big community report out, where they shared what they had seen rise to the top. And what I'm going to give you next is just um, some really quick snapshot pages of summaries. Obviously, a big document like this, it's barely skimming the surface. But um, we created a quick infographic to just kind of give the community a sense of some of the things that we looked at. And I will tell you that at the end of the CHAW, they came up with six priority areas that were, um, that the community had, had put together. So the first thing you'd have is the general demographic information. Um, you'll notice on all of these that you have Jackson County, Josephine County, and the state um, for each of these different topics. And You'll notice that life expectancy is slightly longer in Jackson County than Josephine County, 79 years as opposed to 74 years. Um, leading causes of death in the bottom right-hand corner there. Cancer in both counties, but you can see the differences. Um, the light blue is Josephine County and the purple is Jackson County. Um, then they started going into the six priority areas. And you'll see if you read the text that's on the screen that it's fairly simplistic the way they presented it because they agreed that everything that we produced needed to be at a fifth grade level because we wanted to make sure and, and things translated back into Spanish as well so that things could go out to the community and make sense that we were listening and we were hearing. Um, and so there's the drug and alcohol use was the number one uh, priority that came out of the assessment as an issue concerning health um, of our providers and of our community members. So some of the quick statistics, 11th graders who currently use alcohol, 34% um, in Jackson County, 30% in Josephine County. Um, hospital stays related to substance use per 100,000 people. 
in the two counties. Wherever there was state da data easily available, they included that, but it may not show up on some of these um, infographics that you'll see. And what we realized when we had the first readout with the consultants, at the end of it, there was silence in the room and kind of a collective groan. And people said, wow, that's really depressing. It's really oppressive. And you kind of didn't want to continue with the conversation because seeing all those statistics of things that aren't going very well and that need addressing was pretty overwhelming, especially to a room full of people who are doing their very best 60 hours a week to serve people and to make things better. So we decided that after that, there would be at least something on each of the pages that was good news when we went out to the community because we want to make sure we're starting to, and certainly as we continue forward, share success stories because there is a lot of good work. We have gained ground. Focusing on just what needs to be done is helpful because for a health improvement plan, that's what we want to know. But we also want to make sure for our community, we let them know a lot of good work is in the works. The second um, priority for out of the community health assessment was affordable housing. And affordable housing came up, but it also came up in the context of homelessness and appropriate supportive housing, accessible housing for seniors um, that want to age in place, um, supportive housing with services for families and for those that need services um, wrapped around them, as well as just the general affordable housing for our community. And specifically, some of the providers said, we can't recruit the behavioral health staff we need because there's no housing for them. Even if we could get them to come here, if they can't afford to live on the salaries, we can pay them. So there were a lot of layers to why housing came up as the number two, probably most of which won't surprise any of you. Um, so three out of four people that were asked said affordable housing was a top issue affecting this community. Um, one out of five that was surveyed had at least one severe housing problem. Severe problem is in complete kitchens, or um, plumbing facilities. Um, and then the other big statistic is the house there on the right, homes where housing costs are 30% or more of their income. And actually we found there were a significant portion of the population in both counties where it's 50% or more is going to housing. So it's no wonder they can't afford health care um, or basic services. Next one, mental health was third. Um, and the fact that substance use and mental health were in the top three together, as you'll see when we get to the chip, meant that behavioral health became kind of number one um, for us in looking at the health improvement plan. Um, and it's mental health for a variety of reasons and across a variety of age groups. One out of six 11th graders in the student wellness survey reported thinking of suicide. Three out of 10 11th graders um, in the region reported signs of depression. One out of four adults reported having a depression diagnosis sometime during their life. Um, some pretty, and I, none of those are things that are surprising to any of you, I am sure. The next topic that came up was parenting support and life skills. Um, ways to wrap our families in ways to build resilience and to understand how to be strong families for their children, ways that they can access community supports, parenting education, and a big one that came up in this conversation was how to destigmatize the idea of parent education because people who might think they need help and want to seek services, assume that they're the only person who doesn't know how to do it. And they don't want to say, gosh, I need help. I don't know how to do that. Because it somehow is really stigmatized by the community. When the reality is all of us, everybody who's ever been a first time parent goes home from the hospital and says, where is my owner's manual? I have no idea how to look up in the middle of the night what this means and what to do. So a lot of things around parenting support and life skills, especially in light of all the ACEs and resilience work that's happened in this community over the last decade and certainly in the last five years. Um, so there was a lot of talk and a lot of work around ACEs and it came up a lot in conversations in community forums and in surveys because obviously there's been a lot of awareness and a lot of training going on and a lot of your organizations have started to question people differently when they come in for intake and a lot of, there's a lot of awareness out there now for people about ACEs. For me, the one that stuck out on this, this chart was that one out of 10 11th graders feel that they have no one to protect them. One out of 10 16 year olds feels like there's nobody that's looking out for them, which is a, astonishing. So after we got all the data and we started looking at it, the next thing was to take all of that and identify and prioritize the strategic issues out of the list. So the CHA had originally come up with top 15 key themes. The six that you just saw are what we ended up with. And the way we got there is by having a half day community strategic prioritization meeting where we took those top 15 key themes and said, how important is it? 
Should we do it? What will we get out of it? Can we demonstrate that we've got measurable outcomes and we're making a difference? And can we do it? Is there political will, community will, technical will? Um, economically, is there support for it? Can we do it? So using that criteria, those top 15 themes were ranked. And what ended up happening, as you saw, is that mental health and substance use, for sure, came out as really critical number one. So these are the six key themes that were prioritized. And out of these, there was another process then to go through and figure out what can we tackle in 2019, 2022 with this current community health improvement plan. The conversation, you'll see that poverty and jobs is on there. The conversation around the fact that every single one of these, as we started having conversations, had poverty as a through thread, meant that the poverty was going to be a lens for the entire community health improvement plan. That we're aware in our, in our region that poverty is always affective and that we've got to keep that in mind when we're looking at any of these other issues. Um, education and job training um, didn't appear on here so much as it kind of got absorbed at least partially into um, education around some of these different topics and um, certainly in the parenting and life skills area. So what you ended up with was these three priorities in the community health improvement plan for the next three years. Behavioral health, mental health and substance use, which I will tell you, although you use the term and are very comfortable with it, most of the community has not got any idea what behavioral health is, so we are going to continue to use mental health and substance use with it as a clarifier, and hopefully by the end of three years from now, people will have behavioral health as, an, as a normal word, as a normal term, but right now, behavioral health for people means my kid's misbehaving at school. Um, behavior, the, just the word behavior, is awkward for the general community, so we're having to do some education around that. Parenting support and life skills, and safe, affordable, accessible housing. Those three then had to be put into some kind of a plan. What are we gonna try and do about that in terms of a strategic plan? So the document you have in front of you is the result of that. We put together work groups. There were a couple of people in here that participated in those work groups, one for each of the priority areas that from February to May met and wrestled with what could the community tackle? What should the community tackle? What do we think we have the resources to tackle? What are some of the things that are already happening that we can build on? And in behavioral health, what we ended up with um, as the six high-level community goals are lessening the effects of trauma, helping young people and older adults feel less alone because those were two identified vulnerable populations, especially in terms of suicide ideation. Providing the community with ways to accept and help people who need behavioral health services. There was a lot of conversation in actually all three priority areas around stigma. And that for the mental health of our community, we really need to destigmatize all of these issues and make it just plain and simple. This is something we as a community need to be doing something about and working on and that all of us is impacted in some way or another, probably by all three. Um, preventing the use and misuse of substances. Promoting ways to reduce the harm that happens with mental health and substance use issues, and we focused on some harm reduction strategies. And then improve access and coordination of care for people needing mental health and addiction services. All the kinds of things you all do every day. In the parenting support and life skills, the four goals help families feel connected, cared for, and strengthened. Help families have access to safe, affordable, and quality child care. Increase access to healthy food. And have community-based organizations working together to help deliver coordinated services. We heard a lot from parents about agency fatigue, that sometimes it's not that there aren't enough services, they just wear out going door to door to try and access all of them and taking the time off of work that it takes to wait in line, to get through the queue, to get to someone who tells you, oh, wrong door, you need to go over here. And so sometimes the parents just prioritize and say, I can only take the time to deal with one of our issues because it's too complicated. And then the third priority area, housing, two big goals. Increase the number of people that are paying 30% or less of what they earn for housing, and increase the number of people that are living in homes that are safe, accessible, and easily served by community services. Um, and so there's obviously in the discussions had a lot to do with um, policy and advocacy and influence on some of those kinds of things. So as of July, starting into the action cycle, what do we do with this now that we've got it? Because the reality is it's a strategic plan for the community. So it's not like the Regional Health Alliance or any one organization is going to activate all of those things, but it's who in the community is already doing some of that work or is about to take on that work or who looking at this chip says that's a fit for us. That fits our mission and our work plan and where we're trying to head. 
So we start to plan, implement some of the objectives to get to those goals, evaluate how we're doing periodically, and then replan and go back in, into that cycle. And that's where we'll be between now and 2022. We did decide early on that it was really critical to build on existing work, that to do something this big and collaborative, the first thing is let's make it easy for organizations, small and large, to find a way to engage. And so if you are part of a small organization that has a small staff and maybe is just thinking maybe I'll put my toe in the water but I'm not sure I'm all in for this yet, maybe submitting one um, organizational objective from your strategic plan that aligns with one of the goals in the chip is going to be your way in initially in the first in the first action cycle. There are other organizations that have been part of this process since 2016 who are ready to start saying we've got you know 30 or in the case of some organizations oh my gosh we're working on every single one of these right now. Um, I know the FQHCs looked at the list and said oh dear that's going to mean pretty much submitting everything we're doing. Um, the structure for All In For Health as it exists right now, because this is community-wide, it's community-held, it's morphing and shaping as it goes and as people come on board, um, is that JRHA, um, the Regional Health Alliance, is the backbone organization that's making sure that it gets funded and coordinated and organized and sort of holding it lightly for the community. Um, I'm the project coordinator currently, and then there's a core team of seven, pretty much a coalition of the willing whose bosses said, yes, I know it'll take a lot of your time, but we really think this is important, so we're willing to lend you to this community initiative. Um, a steering committee um, representing 19 organizations who've said, we will put our people together in the room monthly or every other month to be tracking on this and helping guide the process. Um, and then work groups that have formed. And the work groups just came back together in October. Um, so there is a behavioral health work group that met for the first time at the end of October. They met again this month. They're scheduled to start meeting monthly now. They'll meet again in, in January. And those are made up of anybody in the community, individuals or organizations or agencies or collaboratives or initiatives who thinks that the goals and strategies from this CHIP document are, rel are relevant to their work and or to work that they aspire to do and wants to jump in and be part of a learning community and part of the conversation around how we as a community um, start addressing some of these goals. And so for instance, the behavioral health group right now has probably 20 to 30 that attend the meeting, but it has an email list of 80 that have asked to receive the information and the materials and may phone in and listen in or participate in some way um, just to start to figure out how they connect in. and. Um, Darren is on that group, Danny's on that group, I'm not sure. I think others of you are too, but I'm not familiar with everybody in all the groups yet. So it may be that you have colleagues in here who can give you updates and keep you connected with that work um, or let you know, you know when the next meeting is. If you are interested, the next Behavioral Health Work Group meeting is actually coming up Wednesday, January 22nd at 8.30 in the morning. They're usually an hour and a half long, 8.30 to 10 on the 22nd. Um, it'll be in Grants Pass and Danny Swafford is the co-chair of that group, so Danny can keep you apprised of the agenda for that. But anyway, this gives you kind of a sense of, on the left is the, the bodies that are sort of guiding and supporting the process and making sure we have funding and bodies to do things. On the right is the group that is actually gonna be out there forming the learning, commu learning community around what are we doing, what do we wanna do, where are there partnership opportunities that we didn't know about? Where are six groups doing the same thing and they need to talk to each other? Um, where has somebody got land they wanna build on and somebody's got something that needs land? Um, trying to make connections, connect the dots as a community and make best use of the resources and the expertise that we have together. The other thing I will tell you about this um, chip so far is that we've been asked to make presentations in a number of places, one of which was for the um, Jefferson Funders Forum, which is private philanthropy that covers Jackson and Josephine County. And they were really interested um, when this first started coming up, they were interested in the CHA, and then when the CHIP came out, they said, wow, it would be great for us as we're setting up our criteria for funding for the next cycle to be able to look at that and say, we are prioritizing these. If your request matches any one of these things, you're already automatically head and shoulders above anybody else coming in because then we can support the community moving the needle on these important things that they've prioritized. And so it may be that there are opportunities for braided funding. And we had a couple of foundations say, boy, it would be so great if instead of 12 little small entities coming to me and saying, we could use $2,000 to do this, if they were all talking to each other and said, we'd like to do this and we could write a $50,000 check and really do something. So I think there are some opportunities for us as we talk to each other um, to gather 
gather some strength around funding and around resources that maybe we're not currently tapping or even bigger federal resources that we're not currently tapping for our community. So the next step with all of this, now that we've got this document, the work groups are going, um, is we have created a series of tools to start to gather the objectives and action steps and process measures of organizations and agencies who are doing current work that aligns with the CHIP or who plan to do in 2020 or 2021 work that aligns. So if you look at the example there, and it's small enough, you may not be able to see it, but the goal has already been set in the CHIP. The population outcome measures, the strategies have been set in the CHIP. What we're looking at now is in your organization, when you look at your strategic plan and your mission and your work plan for the coming year or three years, what are organizational objectives you have that tie in, that are supporting these goals and strategies? What are the action steps you're going to take to achieve your objective? And how are you gonna measure what you did? And we're asking that organizations submit those things to this collective. Um, and then we will be reporting out um, quarterly, initially, to all the partners around the work group table around what's happening so that we can start to see places where there might be opportunities for partnership or where we might start to see gaps emerge that help somebody say, wow, our organization's looking to take on something new and it looks like nothing's happening over here and this would be a good place for us. Um, or um, places where there are opportunities for putting out funding requests together. So the next thing is literally that. By March 1st, we hope to have the first iteration of the action plan, which is whatever organizations are willing to start submitting some of their objectives and action steps and process measures. And we'll be getting those back out to the work groups right away. By the end of the year, we'll have the first community report out where we'll say, based on what we heard in the assessment, based on what we prioritized with the CHIP, Here's what's happening in your community um, that you can start to track and learn from. Here are some things that are starting to make a difference and we can start to tell the community story about the good work that's happening, the challenges we still face, um, and the needs where they still exist. If you are interested in downloading or searching or having access to either of these documents or a host of other things, um, there is a website there. It's also um, on the documents that you have in front of you. And that gives you contact information for me or for others connected with the, the project for specific questions. So I guess with that, um, I'll see if there are either questions or maybe comments from those of you that have already participated in some way or who have had someone participating who's got your organization stirred up around some piece of this. You did awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate your patience with a lot of information tracking, but it is interesting. One of the things that we have learned is um, it takes a long time to build a messy collaboration that's this large and with goals that are this audacious. Um, and it also, seems to be um, an ongoing, There's, it's not like you set it up and then it just goes. Um, we keep talking about it every one of the meetings that we feel very much like we are out on dangerous waters building a sailing ship while we're sailing and there is no land in sight um, and we're on the boat together. And so hopefully we will continue to sail safely and um, hopefully more and more of you will come on and help us build a better boat. Uh, I want to com comment specifically on the behavioral health outcomes on page 19 uh -huh. of the document uh, and, and uh, I, I come in, I'm, I'm going to make my comments as the past director of a co-occurring disorders program in the valley for 20 years uh, and also the past chair of this body where almost 20 years ago we tried to get all the providers at that time alcohol and drug providers <coughs> uh, we got them together to look at a common outcomes project and while we did a lot of research on the Addiction Severity Index, which is a nationally known functional uh, uh, status uh, model, uh, we couldn't get everybody to agree. So this is a huge task and very, very much uh, worth doing. Um, but as the director of a treatment program, I'm looking at these population-based outcomes, and none of them have to do with the outcomes that occur pre and po or a after treatment. Mm -hmm. They're population-based, and I understand why. But if I'm a treatment program director, I'm looking what can I what can I focus on here? Um, there's not much, and I, I guess I would advocate and certainly be happy to be a part of any discussion about preliminary uh, uh, goals, outcome goals, because what you want to measure in addiction treatment, we know two things: we know the longer someone stays in treatment, the better chance for success. And, and we, we also know that they're uh, more inclined to stay involved, uh, counselor or therapist and 
and client relationship is one of the most important things that determines outcomes. So uh, having pre, um, pre and post established outcomes like, for example, uh, days uh, dry or clean pre-treatment, days dry or clean post-treatment um, is a real good measure. The problem usually comes because organizations don't have the funding to be able to follow people for long enough to see that the outcomes occur after treatment. Uh, almost anybody has proven research-wise can stay clean while they're in a treatment episode, whether it's, and, and more if they're in a residential or inpatient, a little bit less percentage-wise if it's outpatient, but they still are able to stay clean while they're in that episode. Uh, as soon as that episode's over, uh, uh, even, even if they're going to an aftercare, the, the, the numbers go down significantly. So I'm just advocating for a discussion about how we get pre and post uh, data to show the difference between a treatment episode, uh, uh, the difference that makes, and also try to include in that discussion how we can fund longer treatment episodes instead of calling it aftercare, call it continuing care, and, and have enough money so that organizations who provide treatment can have at least a third of that resource, whatever it needs, for people to be followed for longer, per longer periods. Uh, the research is clear that you need a lot of treatment on the front end and decreasing doses over time. And so, continual. Continual, yes, continual. Mm -hmm. Because, the, again, the longer someone stays in treatment, the more chance for success. That doesn't have to be in, in a residential arena. It just means really being in touch with those things that got them clean to begin with. So I, I made note of your name and I'll make sure I get your contact information from Eric. Um, Darren is on the behavioral health work group. So we'll make sure that Darren kind of holds that too to make sure that he brings that up with the group. And I'll bring it up with the data team um, to make sure that if they're gonna start down a path where they're having those kind of conversations, they reach out to you um, to participate in that conversation because it sounds like it's a key point. Okay. Well, really and and Angela, is that, is that part of this process that it's more global? Like I'm going to survey all the kids in eighth grade throughout Jackson County? These population outcome measures were selected. Maybe Darren, you, do you want to talk about it since you were in that group? Maybe that's better than me trying um, to summarize what I'm you did. I'm not sure I could speak to them because I wasn't in that, that particular <laughs> that group. Yeah. Um, you were in a what? Sorry. I wasn't in that particular group when that discussion happened. So um, last, last year, the National Association of addiction treatment providers release their outcome study measures that they're expecting their folks to start using after a couple of years of looking at how to do it breaks down the process questions to ask how to follow up they're also looking at all treatment providers who are members being accredited mm -hmm. uh, after january of 2020 of next year oh, wow. Yeah, the National Association, and that's Betty Ford, Hazelden, a lot of large organizations are part of that. But they did that this last year or this, I, I have a terrible time with time going backward. Mm -hmm. So it could have been the beginning of this year, the end of last year. But that's one place to start where there's this data that's, where there's a, um, format for it and how to do it. It goes through when, how, and, and where to do it and how to get all the people and at, at what particular intervals. And they spend a lot of time doing that. Um, UCLA has also developed uh, standardized tracking forms that they use for follow-up of treatment. But it's the most difficulty we have is when folks that we serve most of us in this room serve. How do you get a hold of folks? Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't have cell phones that, mm -hmm. that 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 have a lot of time on them. They they change addresses. There, you know, there are a lot of, of challenges. That's not to say we shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But in treatment outcome studies, also, you have to look at the percentage of people you can reach. Can it be extrapolated in the size of the treatment uh, population itself which are all considerations when you go into doing this it isn't simple and it isn't uh, you know it, it makes it hard for organizations because of cost and time constraints mm -hmm. so 
It's something we should work on. Right? But just, with you yeah. saying what you're saying, then I'm assuming that it must be fairly common for you to have people leave treatment when they are not ready to leave treatment, and you don't necessarily know why they left, where they went, what happened to them afterwards. Well, that's, that's been true in behavioral health. In the 1950s, they did a very a study of psychiatrists at the uh, VA, and I, I believe it was uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and they asked them, what kind of therapy do you do, and how long do you see their client, your clients? And they said, I do, most said, I do long-term psychoanalytic psychotherapy, and I see my people for long-term. And when they actually looked at the data, half of the people who came in dropped out after one session, and most people came six sessions. Mm -hmm. So you have a limited time, and people drop out um, pretty consistently out of, out of treatment for baby and for health. Mm -hmm. You have to develop a report really quickly. You have to follow up. It's not just a matter of you show up in my office, I'll treat you. It's you didn't show up today, how do I reach you? How do I reach out? Because there's a lot of work in what we do. It isn't it isn't an easy it isn't an easy process. And um, I think we should do it. I, I just think how do we pool one of the keys, I think, is pooling everybody's resources. Mm -hmm. When you when you have things like um, uh, the e e o e reliance, right, mm -hmm. where people put data in, and we can track clients over time. Where do they pop up again, and how do we see them, and how do we sort of generate those outcomes? Are really um, important, but it's it's a a uh, difficult task we should take on. Uh, and that's a group, um, guess why I'm saying it out here is, that's a group task. If we try to mm -hmm. bite it off alone, we're gonna have the same problems over and over of not having resources, not being able to contact people. But the greater we get at sharing resources and sharing information across systems, like in, in the, uh, um, HIE health information mm -hmm. uh, systems. We'll get better at this. I think those that, that we've tried on uh, behavioral health over the last, I know in my last position we went to pre-manage and you could see where where people were coming, going into the ER and others. I mean, we have some tools available that if we work together, I think we can, we can get there. And you know, ultimately for me, it's about serving the population in the community I live, whether that's here or anywhere I live, because that's what I decided to do stupidly. But I, it's I really interesting oh, that, no. that, that this conversation arose, though, because one of the things that the work groups are going to be doing, they're pretty much self-governing. So the work groups are going to be deciding what it is that needs to be learned and addressed. It may be that there's a subset of that behavioral health work group that needs to focus on what do we need to do about data? You know, what is it that we want to measure? What are we able to measure? What's aspirational for us? How do we get started? How do we have this conversation? And that may be a really important part of that work group's um, work together. So I'm not, I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. I, I, I want to endorse everything Alan said and just make two other quick points. In order to have uh, reliable and valid data, you have to have a numerator and denominator. And it's, it, the denominator has to be all those you intend to treat or a representative sample. So if it's all those you intend to treat, even if they drop out, they're still part of the denominator, which is why you have such disparity in treatment organizations who report, oh yeah, well so many people finished treatment. Well, how many dropped out in the first week or after mm -hmm. the third session? So it's got to be a, a, a standard denominator. You can, you can decide whether it's a representative, representative sample or all, the, all those you intend to treat. And uh, the other thing is that if you, you can take representative samples, smaller ones, from a variety of organizations, if those organizations agree to what is going to be measured and um, use the same instrument. And the instrument doesn't have to be a national one. It can be one that's locally developed. And I, I'm saying this from being a CARF surveyor for 25 years and being passionate about measuring outcomes for mental health and substance abuse populations. So it's possible to do on a, on a smaller scale. I have intimate knowledge with the standards. There's about seven of them, which 
show how you measure things. And, and I just, I, I, we, it's time maybe to bring them up. Maybe 20 years ago was too early, but now is the time. Because especially, I didn't know that what you said, Ellen, about the, the uh, National uh, Addiction Organization requiring accreditation. So that's great for my student position. Yeah. Well, the federal government is looking at it, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. Well, and, and for me, it, it kind of goes back to that discussion of I love the global indicators of health within our community, the idea that all eighth graders, out of all eighth graders, this many had this personal belief or feeling. I think that's really helpful. Then I'm also really interested in system type indicators, like if somebody identifies, hey, I might need some help or want to do some work around a substance use disorder, that's just what people say, isn't it, when they go and they're ready for help. Um, but, when they, uh, but when they're at that point, can they identify a resource? Can they access a resource? Um, you know, that connection is really important, I yeah. think. And then on an agency level, are folks being served and are they getting the help they need? Do agencies need assistance and support in that? Um, is there enough room? Uh, and I don't know that we always, always do that. I'm always uh, pleasantly surprised, uh, you know, to put Justin Hong on the spot, but when Justin was doing case management with families in our community, and I'd kind of throw my hands up and I'd be like, you know, people have no, no ability to get this, this, or this, or how can they access that? Or how can they know this? And Justin would be like, oh yeah, you just need to do this, you know. But he had this such intensive, and he still does, um, specialized knowledge about how to access resources in our community. How do we either make more Justins or make it easier for folks to know where those resources are? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, sorry, Justin. Yeah. We're all going to write down Justin's the guy to call. <laughs> know, that's right. another name I definitely need to get. Right. <laughs> Darren, is there much friction between what we've traditionally considered mental health and substance use disorder work um, in terms of what should be prioritized or how we look at these services and priorities within the subgroup? Friction might not be the right word, but is there... Uh, how do those two coexist within that setting? Well, I mean, I could speak from the CCOs, from our CCOs point of view. I mean, I think we're seeing them as very equal and, you know, one in the same country without one, without the other, but I'm not quite sure. Oh, just within your subgroup, as you are one of the chairs of the behavioral health subgroup, mm -hmm. and you talk about ways to measure outcomes and yeah. <clears throat> identify kind of strategies? We've, we've, um, haven't dove that deep yet. We've had two meetings, so, um, so I think this is all. This is the right time to have this conversation, so that we can kind of insert some of that expertise that's been relayed here um, into those into those discussions. So we very much are um, in the work groups right now in the first two stages of it's very much kind of <coughs> reorienting everybody to the chip, and, and so we have some work to do. If it marches the deadline, we have some work to do in the next couple of months to get something solid nailed down. So yeah. Okay. And then my my last question. So and uh, did I? Can I offer just yeah. a, you know, you asked such an interesting question there, you know, what's the friction like, but, and it's, it, you know, in light of some of the, the really interesting turf war graphic, it's really, it's li literally, in this community, like most communities, the opposite of a turf war. Um, that's the best way I can characterize it, and we, you know, we do need to change that a little bit. I think I don't. I don't. I don't want there to be a turf war. Right. Um, but there's a real lack of dual diagnosis capable treatment in this community, as it is everywhere. I mean, like you look at even just organizations doing just one thing, mental health or substance use disorder treatment, and there's access is already hard. You know that people don't need to specialize to be busy and full. Although. You know, we all know the best treatment for people with co-occurring conditions, and the, and the majority, you know, literally speaking, more than half of each population has both, um, would be integrated treatment. So we have a long way to go um, as a community, but we're not alone. That's most of the country is, is in that same situation. But, um, you know, I think mental health programs advancing a little bit more into serving the substance use disorder needs of their clients is needed, as well as, you know, clients who maybe are primarily substance use disorder identifying but have mental health as well could get access for both, you know, through their agencies. And some agencies in this community have made, you know, the ARC is dual certified, is COVID dual certified mental health and substance use disorder. And, you know, so there's. But the truth is, you'd be busy doing even just one, you know. Right. Um, and I could, if I could just add, just quickly, that's exactly right. 
I know the veteran population most. Over 70% of the veterans that we treat have co-occurring disorders. Major mental health uh, disorder, excess one, and substance use disorder, uh, in addition to many excess two disorders. But, but I would go back to what Angela said in the slide. Our, the the, the uh, provider community is, is almost like the public in the sense that uh, behavioral health is not well understood in the terms of being co-occurring disorders and that most of the folks who present have many more than one or two issues that we all deal with in all whatever organization we work in so the energy and education needs to go in into that focus for all organizations understanding both and getting accreditation if need be in co-occurring disorders I, I agree because the unfortunate situation is you have the most severe the most ill individuals getting no treatment because you know if they go to many mental health organizations and they have severe substance use disorders the mental health organization says you really need to get your substance use disorder treated you're not super welcome here and this and the converse for substance use disorder organizations if someone's really psychiatrically ill um, they say you know you're pretty ill kind of beyond our and so we have these people uh, with the most severe illness with out a clear place to get treatment and you know that that's a problem and it's really our fault because there's over 20 years worth of research that suggests that you treat the whole person from the moment they come in and and they they you treat what they present so it's it's our collective public problem with that with that molding um, and we just have to do it. The other, problem with that, the other problem with that, though, is um, the way they're funded. That's Insurance exactly code, also security. Oh yes. my gosh, it's exactly trouble. true. The, the yeah. addiction world. You know, well, in physical health, when you add physical health to that too, and they're trying to figure out what kind of coding do I put on this so I can get reimbursed, because what they present with that might fit the physical codes is not actually the problem that needs addressing. So, I mean, frankly, in mental health, a lot of organizations are like, "Why would we do? Why would we bill?" Why would we treat substance use disorder? Because if we use those codes, it reimburses us less. Right. You know, why would we even do this? And so, uh, even though we know that's how people get better, and really we should be in the business of helping people get better, right. not filling out the right code or trying to get reimbursed is the best we can. Um, but that's that's a big challenge for us. It is. And Sam, so would you speak to that? You, you just heard something about um, about funding the, the national uh, requirement to, to do no, outreach? I was at an ALEC meeting this earlier this month, and basically they've set the standards. Indiana just adopted them 100%, uh, both the House and the Senate. And they're talking about the certification of the funding, and it's coming from the federal government. Trying to you know, standardize the minimum. All I know is that I was looking at the uh, list, and Oregon's totally in compliance. From what I saw, we, we don't have any problems. But, uh, it's being addressed, like people were saying here, it's being addressed on several levels. But, you know, you were mentioning the federal, I've seen it with the, uh, you know, American Legislative Exchange Council that brought up, so. But, I mean, the problem is, if you're already full, what's your incentive to see sicker people? <coughs> well, and finding staff who have the qualifications, even if you have the certification, finding somebody that truly knows how to do it. Right. Yeah. Right. There's a right. And you're in housing, and you can't even you yeah. can't house them if you bring them from Nebraska. <laughs> right. But no. it's you know it's a it's very it, it, you know and it it's very complex when you start to talk about it. It would be great to put to have the people to do it and the funding stream because actually if you're doing co-occurring treatment when we've looked at it, it's like the funding is less. It's like, so if we do this, we're gonna get less money. It's it, the way it's set up just makes it makes you know. I worked for and I in, in what they used to call an institute for mentally retarded, right? That's what they used to call it. Not my. That's what they called it. And in the state of Washington, and for anybody who had uh, uh, developmental disabilities and mental illness, those people were kicked from institution back, forth, not treated. I think the same thing existed in Oregon. Yes. And people would say, it's not ours, it's yours. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we've come a ways from, from that, but there's still these funding silos that if you're gonna do this, you get funding for that. If you're gonna do this, you get funding for that. You think how do we, again, collaborate and cooperate by making agreements like can send somebody across the street and they can get an appointment right away. I'm gonna send them across the street and then try to work with them around this client. Um, there are ways I think we can do it, but it, the, um, it's not easy, it ain't easy. It just ain't easy. God, I feel like I should leave. Like no, no, I think this doom is Doom and gloom <laughs> today or something. I, I really think that on a positive standpoint, we see it here, there's no partisanship with all of this local. And you don't see partisanship at the state level, and you do not see partisanship at the federal level. Everybody wants to find a solution. And that, to me, that's the major strength. Everybody's looking for a solution. So when you're talking about a collaborative effort, we all want it. And it's at, from what I'm seeing, it's at every level. There's not, and there's no cutoff. You know, first step back that, uh, you know, I, I was involved in that. Uh, that was strictly bipartisan. And a lot of the other things that are coming down are bipartisan. There's not, you know, we don't have the divide we do with other issues here. So I really think that that's our main strength is that everybody is looking for a solution. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with partisan politics. Mm -hmm. We've got a problem, we want to address it, we want to fix it. So I'm, I'm very positive about it. What you're doing, I, I love it. It's, just, it's, it's a very good presentation, Absolutely. and I really like it. You know, it, it makes sense, Jackson, Josephine County coming together, pooling resources. It's extremely, extremely beneficial. And hopefully more of this will be going on nationally in other areas. That's is it still true, though, that, that mental health funding stream and <coughs> addictions or uh, substance use disorder is separate at the state level? It is, right? Yeah. So, no I, uh, well, I don't know yeah. if I, I, I tried, I tried <laughs> several years ago to meet and, and get, you know, different individuals from LADPC to meet at mental health and vice versa. And even suggested to a couple of different administrators that we have joint meetings. I think there, I don't know for certain, but I think the resistance back then was from the provider community, the the prescriber community. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's that same level of resistance mm -hmm. now. But unless the funding changes, has been suggested, all we can we can collaborate all we want. But if you can't get reimbursed for that difficult client, and and have those providers under your roof that are needed, then it's not going to work. And uh, I don't know that that's a, a, a state level decision or if there'd be any way to, to get it, the funding uh, more uh, equal or, or um, at least combined or a pilot or something. But that, I travel a lot around the country and that's a problem a lot of places. Mm -hmm. You can't get the state to agree to have a a behavioral health funding stream. So is, who locally participates on the state's behavioral health collaborative? Do we have local representation working at the state level on that behavioral health collaborative? I'm just wondering if that group is having that conversation at the state level about So OCBH funding. right now is working on that. Um, and I, I'm new to this, so I'm going to speak to it kind of stupidly. But um, they're working on a, a piece. If you're an LCSW and you deliver a service in the mental health you know, group or a one-on-one -on -one or whatever, you get paid X amount. If you do the same exact service in an addiction center, the, the drop is in what you get paid is pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. And so they're working right now to, to work on parity. When they start talking about parity, how many years ago, 10 years ago, or mm -hmm. I don't know, for yeah, a long time. Law. But this law, exactly. Right. But it isn't in practice. Well, that's just a minor so, fact. So they're working on that. I mean, we get, what is it, $120 a day is what we get for a residential person. From, uh, from OHP, yeah. Food and housing and treatment. I mean, it's a losing proposition. But yeah. So you have to make it up in other ways, you know. So yeah. It's, we're, always, we're always underfunded. We're always under the gun in that respect. And, and then you throw in, you know, the, the federal laws in terms of our ability to talk with each other. You know, moving over to La Clinica for those 10 years was a relief because, you know, continuation of care, I could talk to lots of people. 
but you're in the addiction, you're hamstrung right. in so many ways in terms of like collecting this data that you're talking about. Right. You know? Well, and Kim, just really, I'm just glad you brought up your the work you did at the clinic around phys, you know more comprehensive yeah. physical health because there's things that are endemic to uh, mental health disorder and substance use disorder where a person's gonna have a hard time making and keeping appointments over a prolonged amount of time, but for an agency to get paid, it's really upfront on that assessment, so they have to be there and it's assessment driven. It's gonna really be based on whether or not that person can make all of their appointments, and at some point, I'd really like to see the state explore different models where we recognize that there are things inherent to this these particular um, fields that would be better served by other payment methods. And there'd still be accountability, but you could really treat somebody over time. Because if I'm a poor uh, patient for diabetes, that physician's still gonna meet me each time and they might give me a little bit of shame and they might tell me I, I need to not miss appointments or I need to live differently, but I'm still gonna be seen and that, that physician will be paid. Within an addictions agency, I might have to go all the way back through, we might have to look at an assessment, we might have to look at whether or not I can, I can reestablish care. There's just all sorts of barriers that don't fit with what we're trying, the population we're trying to serve. Right, exactly right. Yeah. We would get alternative payments um, that look like I know ABC, uh, per member per month. So that the coaches, which essentially are, are what we have as peers, right? They're on their A, you know, QMHAs. Um, so that those guys could do their work. Because we couldn't bill out for yeah. QMHAs. <coughs> In the addiction world, you can actually bill out and get more money for QMHAs than you can QMHPs. Which is another really crazy thing. Yeah, so a group that a peer does, we get more per hour that a peer does, and they probably do as, as good work, but they're not certified as a direct alcohol counselor. I mean, there's some really wonky kinds of things. You know, so. Right, because they bill by the 15 yeah, minute increment. The, exactly. And a group is paid at a certain rate, rate regardless of who does it. Exactly. But it, it's also, um, it, you know, when you talk about policy, these are things that, these are policy decisions mm -hmm. that, that get in the way of, of providing care. I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday about how many people are seen in primary care who have addiction and substance use. Most people who have those have substance use and addiction challenges are going to be seen in primary care, and they're not going to get help because they don't want it. Right. So you know, the bulk of the population is coming to see their physician, and for for primary care, and then if they go to specialty care. That's a very small percentage of the population that needs to be reached, and how do we all? I don't know that in my lifetime this is going to get solved. Um, I would be willing to bet it probably won't, but it would be nice. It would so, be nice if we all went out of business. So I, I'm just <laughs> things are just popping for me here. I got I got to put this out. Uh, the, the the policymakers, if if you could incentivize. First of all, everybody, no matter what door they come in, if we can agree that 70 or 80 percent of the folks coming through whatever door they come in have co-occurring disorders, and if you could get policymakers to fund the behavioral health stream, if say alcohol and drug organizations got certified as co-occurring and mental health organizations got certified, or they probably don't even need to be certified they in A and D. Yes, they do. They do. Okay. Well, well so if everybody got co. If, if, it, if everybody got co-occurring uh, capability and competency, and then you funded uh, on a research-based way in which the longer time someone's in care, the more chance they have for success, then you could, uh, that, would, that would help to justify changing the separate funding streams and also prove better outcomes, uh, hopefully, because you'd have people in care longer. And, that, and I don't mean in a residential level or, uh, or an outpatient level, I just mean contact with longer period of contact with decreasing doses. You mean patient-centered care? <laughs> yeah, yeah patient-centered care. It's team-based care on a community. Yeah, level. or team-based care. Yeah, that's awesome. Because you, 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 you don't have to own the prescriber, you can partner with I, I mean, I agree with you. I think this community is amazing. I've been doing this work since the 80s, 
And really, it's the most cohesive I've seen this, this community in so many ways. I think if we could make the laws, we would not be having this conversation. I mean, this all seems ridiculous to us. Yeah, right. But it's getting it changed. You know, addiction isn't even recognized from a point from the law point of view. I mean, we're kind of a non-entity. It's you know really crazy from you know as a as a anyway. Yeah. So. But I don't have a constituency. The answer. To yeah. Well, thank you all so much for being willing to participate in this. And Angela Warren, thank you. Thank you. Let's see. So we have local treatment provider, up. well, Jackson County updates. Dr. Mann, you're here. Sorry, I've been in and out. I've had, speaking of bridge clinic, I've had a couple of patients walk in, and I have another one that I'm going to have to go down. He just walked in, so I want to see him. So bridge clinic continues. Um, we're kind of reimagining, you know, what the next, this, it's been a great 18, 19 month pilot project, trying to imagine what it will look like, um, you know, the next iteration, you know, rough draft, it would be behavioral medicine clinic um, with easy to access uh, medical treatment of addiction and psychiatric care um, with referrals to appropriate mental health and um, addiction treatment. Still trying to figure out how to make that work exactly, um, but the streamlined entry is really something that um, I think has been really successful um, and seeing a lot of walk-ins. My schedule is not less full, um, kind of leaving time for people just walk in. So uh, I think that's what it takes for a lot of people. Um, treatment on demand, being available when people are ready and been working pretty good. So still figuring it out, but we're going from there. Well, in the community, the people in the community who would access this service know about it generally to a large degree? Hopefully not to a large degree because we don't have a large degree of access. Right now it's still limited to just serving exchange population and relatives or cohabitating partners of people who I'm otherwise treating um, through the syringe exchange. That's keeping me busy right now. So hopefully we would expand at some point, but um, right now it's pretty much serving that population, which if you think of a population to serve, people who are actively injecting drugs is, is pretty worthwhile, I think. Um, and it's a little bit different, you know, it's a, it's a different sliver of population that I think is served by many other um, avenues. You know, really the goal is to take people who are currently using and maybe just contemplative and help them through a lot of motivational interviewing and medical stabilization get to the point where they do want to engage in further treatment. So um, it's kind of new, a new stream really I think in a lot of ways and you know some some are more ready than others but we've had some really amazing successes in partnership with both people who are going on the on track. We've got one who's graduating outpatient tomorrow who started in syringe exchange. Sorry. Yeah, did residential at Grants Pass, IOP, graduating yeah. outpatient tomorrow, on track. Um, and uh, over a extended period he's, of time. He stayed with me because he trusts me and I'm okay with it. That's good. Um, and he, doesn't, he hasn't had a primary care provider, although he's, he's got an appointment at La Clinica next week. Um, so, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to push people out who are doing so well because it's nice to see some people doing really well but ARC, you know, in partnership with ARC as well so um, you know, I really see it as, as not an alternative type of treatment, it really does tail with your type of treatment, it just aimed at a little bit different population really kind of a people who are just contemplative to begin with and need that medical stabilization to really have the room in their headspace to think about a different kind of life so when I was at an event just last week and somebody basically said, oh, I'm so thankful for that program. Uh, they believed that it was uh, directly responsible for helping them knock into infectious disease. And it was exactly what they needed at that time in their life. And they're working a long-term plan of recovery at this point. But it was just, I don't know if you always get to see those people down the road, but it was a really neat sentiment that that person yeah. was really grateful about. So About syringe exchange? For syringe, yeah, needle exchange and oh, nice. the services they received there. So. Oh, good. Yeah, we've had some patients go on to the VA. Um, it's really, you know, it's a feeder for a lot of different, a lot of 
people are starting to, um, with Laclinica's Lequin up staffing, they, you know, I've seen an acceleration recently in their capacity to accept patients, so it's, it's been helpful. And I gotta run downstairs. Yes, absolutely, thank you, I appreciate it. All right, treatment provider updates. Um, the ARC. Uh, we're, I think we're doing okay. Our, our fire recovery is going right along. It'll still be nine months to a year, but <clears throat> they keep saying we should put it out on our reader and we're on fire for recovery, but they keep saying <laughs> <laughs> it's too soon. So, uh, well, we're doing, we're doing so, fine. That's good. Um, we are um, having some fun working with the jails and kind of putting together that match program, which will be really fun. I got to tour the other day the jails and it's been a while since I've um, had a chance to, to do that. I actually haven't been that deeply into the jail. When you go over to do an assessment, they keep you kind of on the outside. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. So we got to kind of look around, and that was that was pretty impressive. And it's exciting kind of program. I think the other pieces are um, the House Bill 41, 43, 43, 41, whatever that is, um, working on working with OnTrac and working on uh, getting our peers up to the EDs and deeper into the hospitals yeah. uh, to figure out what they need at that time. And so there's been some nice collaborative phone calls um, and meetings around that work. And um, what I'm excited about is that I think everybody's taking this attitude of it's not my client, it's not your client, it's, it's a community member, and where do they need to be? And that's, I think, if we can stay there and not worry about who's getting what, we'll be okay. Because the capacity with the uplift at La Clinica and Rogue Community Health has capacity. Some of these other places, um, we've got some capacity, I think, to catch these folks and really hold on to them. Our peers are going up sometimes to the heart unit two, three times a week mm -hmm. to meet with folks, and I'm sure your folks are too, just to hold on to them until they are ready to kind of exit. And I think we'll have that opportunity through the jail, which I'm pretty excited about. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and there's whatever other sundry things that are going on. Very cool. All right. Jody, talk about Ally. Not really a whole lot. We're hoping to have an open house in February. So we can invite some community partners over and we'll be on the table again for the year's year. So I'm excited about that. Dr. Seamus is here again. Today at our hangout, she's nice. He's here twice a month. So we have some great people that are here. Well, just again to express my, my gratitude both to the Medford Treatment Center, but Allied and Jody, the fact that you guys are here, I think that does speak to community norms and health changing uh, because for a long time it was, well, that's a different entity or that's a different field and it really is uh, just another um, essential health intervention we have for people with SUD in our community. So thank you for your commitment for being willing to come here. Yeah. Boulder Care. Uh, so or Dr. Lynch is out, so I'm representing for him right now. And uh, we are just currently so working on getting some contracts signed and looking to expand um, nationally and we're continuing to move forward. Sounds good. What community what what communities do you guys do work in currently? Right now we're here and we're working towards Alaska right now. Okay. We right. should be in Alaska in the middle of next month. I know it's amazing when you say that. Does that make sense? Well it's telemed, right? We're do, so Boulder's telemed. Yeah, yeah. We do everything okay. through an ask. But There's this thing called the internet. Right. <laughs> Not in the comfort of your own. Right, right. Yeah. I know. Yeah, it's lonely. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> right. Oh. All right. Yeah. Thank you, though, Brandon. I appreciate you representing. Cynthia, Copia. Not a lot of new stuff going on. We're onboarding a couple more master's level clinicians, so capacity is increasing. So send us people. Um, again, everybody's duly credentialed, so mental health and substance treatment. Um, yeah, growing, loving life, being part of this community, it's always awesome, so. Quick question, are you still being able to expand a little bit of capacity for folks with eating disorders in our community? We are, yes, that's our plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're looking at additional trainings right now that will enhance that, um, and our plan is to have a Medford presence probably by mid next year, so, uh, mid 2020, so the, mm -hmm. the next year that's coming right up. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. Uh, Julia, Max's mission. mission. Um, well, we had uh, our meetings in Grants Pass and in Medford, we, as well as the Resource Center for Community Justice twice a week. Um, through that, we're going to hear about more um, 
more saves that have happened in the community and actually in other areas that um, maybe over the past year and then more recently there was one this summer um, as well as others so that's always really good and um, reaching out to more homeless more users we're seeing more of those from the meeting um, sort of trying to scoop them up on the streets as we're there so uh, so that's good it, we, we really want to um, most people a lot of people are using them and also to rent the services. Do you have any needs in here or asks from this group? Uh, I suppose just my, it's, it's important for us. We always try to have uh, re resources in the community available. We would like to build that up on our website because we really see uh, from personal experience and what we, we see a lot of family members come to our meetings um, and people who may be ready now or next week or next month to make a change. Um, that we would like to offer them better access to what is available. And how do they get that? So um, so we would like to build that capacity on our website, and if anybody would like to... Um, Justin, help us with we the we idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just for Justin's phone number. We are in town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anybody else, um, that, would be, that would be a great thing, because there's so much happening. It changes all the time, uh, and it's hard to keep up with. Which is exciting. All right. Metro um, Treatment Center. Megan, you want to introduce yeah. yourself? Or say hi. Hi again. I'm Megan. I'm, I'm not Matt. I'm not <laughs> as tall as Matt. <laughs> right. Um, so we're still in process with the getting the program open. So uh, we have all of our permits now, and so the work progresses, and we will be anticipating doing more preparatory work in the next coming quarter to get things ready to go. So we'll continue to keep you all updated and you know, work with you as we get there. So. All right. Well, thanks again for coming. Sure. Appreciate having you. Alan and Summer, on track. <laughs> don't, don't get all quiet. Now. Right. right. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, just one meeting I'd, I'd like to come to and not say nothing. Um, everywhere I go, there I am. Um, things are, you know, we're, I'm limping along and we're limping along. And things seem to be going uh, uh, pretty well. We, you know, we're still rebuilding and um, reorganizing and that's a process that takes a couple of years or more. And um, so I think we're where we're supposed to be. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, we have some been doing some work on 41, 43. I think we're we need to get you folks addresses. Um, been working with Jim James to get the providers in a room uh, again uh, with the prescribers so that we can sort of know what's going on and we need to bring Allied and uh, Medford. Uh, I'm simply the organizer of the meetings. I am not the facilitator although because then you have to be quiet <laughs> so um we um, that's sort of where we are moving along with accreditation also so. and we've been pretty active in the um, responses to the oregon administrative rules which were really pretty if you didn't see them they were pretty egregious and we've been pretty active in meeting with uh, representatives so that that idea um, you know all the representatives regardless of mm -hmm. uh, party affiliation are pretty uh, have been really helpful with this so um, we continue to stay on on top of that because um, I'm worried about what it will do to mental uh, you know behavioral health organizations including ours the cost and the uh, just uh, um, we, we did a lot of work in this state to reduce the administrative burden and the cost and this just shoots us out of the cannon um, and we continue to push back so along with OCDH and other providers so um, we hope it'll come out in a more provider friendly way in the end it's currently on hold so well, yeah. kudos to Alan and Summer. I mean, you guys put tireless hours into dissecting that and figuring it all out because it was, you know, 
um, foreign to uh, you know a lot of us and just trying to interpret what was going on so for the smaller providers and stuff I mean you guys really acted on behalf of all of us and I think saved us a lot of uh, big problems coming down the line so thank you for your efforts we, we took two tactics one is we're all small businesses and you're really hitting small businesses you're hitting people who are hiring you know have have you know small folks number of people that we hire the potential is to put them all the all on the street out of out of work um, and also just that we've done a lot of work over the years to, to not go back um, it would be a backward well I don't know how far back but we know it would be eight years backward from Senate bill 238 which reduced all this so it's just been pretty it did probably put detox and so right in business I'm sorry it would probably put so right in detox out of oh yeah oh, oh yeah so all of them because of level of RNs that they five to one to put oh, my God. Yeah. five to one there's yeah. no state yeah oh. that requires that yeah you want to put <gasps> five to one crazy. nurses in detox oh, yeah. that's wow. crazy yeah it's it's just really we didn't we didn't somebody else showed up for that one I was like, yeah, five to one. I don't, if this comes up, it wasn't me. It was Reuben, my evil twin. Right. <laughs> and Alan, if we ever had a meeting and you didn't speak, I think we would all be concerned and consider yeah. to cry for help. We would reach out. And reach out. Oh my God, <laughs> keep away from me. Right. All right. I have an opinion. Just ask. It's good. It's good. Sarah, OPG. Yeah, um, the naloxone work group just continues to pull people together around naloxone distribution. So I, I looked over my notes from the last one, and we had pharmacists from JCC, All Care, the VA, Asante, uh, Max's Mission, HIV Alliance, Community Justice, uh, Kelsey Smith Payne from OHA. Um, so we have a lot of people pulling together to try to get the word out about the need for naloxone in our community. I now, with uh, not exactly wearing another hat, but we've been talking so much about politics and getting stuff done and who's in the way and all that. So you guys um, may have heard of Oregon Recovers, some, some of you. So they're going to have a, a planning event um, Friday, January 3rd at the United Way. So I'll just um, pass this out. Um, so I think that we have an opportunity to influence things as well as um, take advantage of the fact that they've They've been working on this, I think, about three years, something like that. So there, it's to, you know, change the terrible statistics of Oregon, get people to create a plan. Where's the money coming from, and where's the accountability? So I, I think that's a summary of it. Yeah, and I think they have some newer initiatives that they're going to be pushing as far as defelonizing particular drug crimes. Is that accurate, Justin? Yeah, yeah. And so I know people may have strong opinions on that, and this would be a forum in which that could be expressed. Fair. Sure. <laughs> All about right. decolonizing uh, right. past convictions. I think there was a time <laughs> to get the next legislation session to address it because then it's going to be a good question to make to the following. Oh, people. right. So particularly that, around the plan. Particularly around the plan. Yes. They want more time uh, to for the plan and they want the plan to be addressed in February. So right. And that's that, a huge piece. It's a huge piece. Absolutely. Um, and then they're also one of my the things that I really like about this organization is that they're that large tent inclusive umbrella for all the different formats and paths that recovery can take and look like in our state and I believe they're still hosting a recovery summit in May and we're going to really try and get as many people it'll hopefully be a Ben I think is that right Ben Sounds recovery right. summit uh, yeah uh, so Ben is gonna be the next recovery summit um, I don't think there's an official date right. on it yet. Um, it is. is it okay? Well, as soon as there's a date, yeah, uh, right? Uh, 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 Riverhouse. Yeah. Riverhouse. Yeah. They 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 talked about April, but um, I, think, I, think I, I don't think it's set officially yet. No, but once we get a date, I think we try and, and rally as many people from Jackson County as we can, um, and we see what we can do to help make sure that there aren't barriers for people who would like to attend make sure that they can make it there I concur sir thank you <laughs> last year like I said it was a blast it was in Eugene I ate yeah. a lot of voodoo donuts it was a, a really it was time well spent though it was, 
So it's not just about the donuts. Um, all right, Stephanie, Recovery Cafe. Yes, Recovery Cafe is going great. So thank you for all of the referrals. We have people come in all the time and say, yesterday someone said Lisa sent them. And <laughs> I have people that keep coming. Um, we have uh, just an amazing group of people showing up on Tuesdays and Sundays. I think it was last week on Tuesday we had 61 people in the house and on Sunday we had 47. That's a lot in Rogue Organic Cafe if you've ever been in there. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing, like super positive, um, just a growing group of kind of younger crowd, 25 to 40 age range I'd say. Uh, really wanting support in their recovery and you know coming out of treatment we're six months into this now and we've had a couple three four people come back so relapse then bounce back and helping them re-engage in services and get you know assigned to circles and just uh, circle leader meetings every month where we're talking to our core leadership who are you know making the one-on-one -on -one and the, the group kind of more drilled down connections with folks and that's really positive right now these guys have been amazing. Uh, we just have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 40 is your cutoff for younger. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Right. You, you know how old I am. I don't feel really good. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think I focus on the age because Seattle, um, who started Recovery Cafe, their age group is 45 to 65. And so they're very curious about how we're reaching these younger folks. And it just looks very different than what they have. And so it, it stands great. out to me being in the network of recovery cafes, so. <laughs> if I can just add, Eric, um, our participants in Rockport are, are really enjoying the recovery cafe, and um, we have a large following of uh, individuals that are attending and really enjoy it, so thank you. Yeah. Happy to have. I think the cool thing about recovery cafe, too, is like, so when say a person goes MIA and one of the members sees them, we will get together and we will go and look for that person. We will bike path it. To, you know what I mean? Yeah, to look for them to, you know, try and reroute their thinking, you know, and support them into coming back, you know. And that was pretty cool to, to be a part of that. And uh, we didn't find the person, but. Uh, We're still looking. <laughs> we tried, you know, and, and uh, as a collaborative effort, you know, us working together, it, it's an amazing facility and, and the camaraderie and the relationships that are built there is just truly amazing. So, awesome. Jeffrey or Darren, did you guys have anything you wanted to add as we round table? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, just our, our um, Matt in Action Learning Collaborative that JCC is pretty known in collaboration with all of our community partners. Anybody been to the, I know it's down there, it's in the but, So, um, it's been pretty successful. We're on, we said session four on team based care. Here in this room, I believe, on Tuesday, we have 50 participants, and we're going to do session five, continuing on the team based care theme. On, um, we went from, it used to be monthly, now we're going every other month, so we're uh, February 13th, and I don't have a flyer, but that is still open to anybody in the room um, to come learn about uh, um, team based care and just managing action. I don't know if you all have anything to say about that in this last couple, but. I know they had really good attendance, the most for any JCC learning collaborative, so there's a lot of community interest. And I think along with that, um, just I think I mentioned our MAT capacity grant funding that we're infusing into the community, hopefully. Um, we have some really exciting uh, proposals that we're hoping to make a decision on by the end of the year. So, um, and this is money that's being um, infused back out to our community partners to help increase access and capacity for medication assisted treatment. Um, many, uh, we have a lot of ex uh, exciting proposals it's hard to pick. Um, and um, maybe touch some of the themes that we've talked about today and increasing um, um, from clinic physical health clinic system to increasing network providers within their system to organizations that provide specialty such treatment and providing um, you know um, enhanced ready for peer support funding to and, and, um, the centers of excellence for for having like a resource for like John Mann's um, bridge clinic to um, um, you know, to help kind of place people where to match them with the right treatment at the right time. Um, so, um, all with an anchor towards sustainability um, for the long run. So, um, a lot going on in that world with us right now. I think one of the neat things about it has been the content has been really great, but it's our whole community in 
the room together talking about whatever, you know, with treatment, and it kind of goes with this theme of, like, we're all working together better than we have maybe in quite a while. So they've been really great experiences. And, and it may have the JCC title on it, but it really truly is community that was through a committee that's been planning, and, and I just want to stress that, that we cannot be doing this without our partners at all. So the credit really goes to us. All right, anything else for the good of the order? Mark your calendars for March 10th. That's the community justice, uh, community uh, treatment training where we're going to have, hopefully, Eric Martin. Um, we will have a specialist talking about gender responsive strategies for women who are justice involved. We will have CEUs for all. We will put uh, pressure on everybody to have their agency fully represented. Scholarships will be available. Um, T-shirts will be uh, given out. It will be a good day, but uh, what's that? A T-shirt tannin? That's the next step. That's what we need. Right. What kind of shirts are they, sir? They'll be uh, hopefully Under Armour. I don't know yet. We're going to be neat. We're going to get We'll work on it. We'll work on it. Right. Right. All right. Well, thank you all for your for uh, meeting today. Uh, we are officially adjourned. Uh, appreciate it. So.